All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. I am dipping my toe into the waters of live streaming. I know I did it once before during the uh, the lockdown sessions that we did um, last year, I believe in May it was. Um, but since then, I haven't really kind of wrapped my head around it. And I finally just decided to go ahead and do it. So without further ado, uh, just a quick introduction. My name is James Ritson. I'm the product expert for Affinity Photo. This is not done in work time. This is just my own little uh, personal passion project, as it were. So essentially what I'd like to do is just have a laid back session, maybe just, you know, answering some questions from people watching, uh, that sort of thing. You know, there's no sales here, there's no tutorials, no demos, uh, nothing like that. It's just literally me um, going through, uh, I, I would have preferred to do something perhaps more fancy, but I decided to kind of go back to basics a little bit and just do some photographic editing because, you know, I, I thought about it the other week and that's you know, since launch, since 1.9 came out, I, I don't think I've actually done any photographic editing <sighs> since Christmas, maybe. I mean, I've taken photographs, but I haven't actually sat down, gone through some uh, photos that I've taken, you know, over the last two years when we could all move about freely and we weren't restricted indoors. You know, I haven't really gone through and, you know, just played around, didn't done some editing. So that's what I want to do. But I want to do it in a kind of like a live session format because I, I thought it would be nice for people to see how I use the software generally for photographic editing. So I've pulled like a, you know, I've gone through, I've culled um, down to this set of images and there's no plan here. There's no script. I'm just going to pick a few and do some edits and see what comes out of it really. And just explain um, a bit about my editing process. So, uh, let's see, I've got the um, sidecar JPEGs as well as the, the raw files. So I'm going to be working from the raw files, of course, um, but the JPEGs just help me uh, quickly preview what's going on and uh, what I'm going to be editing. So um, this one was taken in my garden, yep, August last year. I've, I've barely looked at these, so I'm going to drag this into photo, start editing it. Um, afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll get around to some questions in a minute, but first I'll just uh, start editing this image. Let's get off to uh, a start, shall we? So uh, let's see. Now, here's the controversial thing. So yeah, we're developing a raw file. This is in the develop persona. But to be quite honest, I do very little, if anything, in the actual develop persona. Um, the reason for this is because I like to, I like to process and start with as flat an image as possible so that I can then uh, do all of my work non-destructively with layer stacks in the main photo persona. So for this particular image, um, it already does chroma or color noise reduction for me, so I don't need to bother with that. It's done the lens correction automatically. That's fine. Um, I might... No, I won't even raise the brightness, you know. I'll leave everything as it is apart from just uh, bringing the highlights in slightly and then click develop. So <laughs> I know that's kind of like a controversial thing, but it's just what I prefer to do. Um, yeah, basically all of my editing gets done in the main photo persona. Now, I suppose one kind of question around that might be, you know, I, I know photo doesn't do, in inverted quotes, non-destructive RAW. Okay, it just doesn't. You develop the RAW image, it gets demosaiced, it gets color mapped, uh, tone mapped, you know, it gets gamma encoded if you're in 16-bit, and that's basically it. You know, that's your pixel data, that's your raster data, you're working with that now. Um, for me, that's not a problem. For other workflows, it can be problematic. But for me, um, developing to 16-bit per pixel precision is more than enough than I would ever need, as long as I start with a flat image, you know. Um, for my live streaming purposes, I'm using sRGB, but typically I'd use ROM RGB, which is Profoto, for a wider color space. But since this is going out to YouTube Live, it gets converted to Rec. 709 anyway. Might as well just stick to sRGB. Anyway, enough waffle, enough techie talk. Let's get into this. So first of all, um, let's just do a basic curves adjustment uh, just to push the tones around a little bit. So I'll add a little bit more contrast in, like so. And what I like to do is on the curves dialog, on the blend mode here, I change it to luminosity. So then it's only affecting the luminosity rather than the color intensity. So this is useful 
for a number of reasons, but mainly, you know, you can separate luminosity or brightness and color information. So, you know, you're not intensifying or saturating colors as you push the curves nodes around. Okay, so we've got a little bit more tonal punch going on there. That's fine. I might just quickly do an HSL adjustment and push the color detail up as well. So for the reds, let's just look at the legs here. I'll just kind of push that detail up slightly. And the yellows, ugh, looking a bit garish. Okay, so I might just use the hue shift slider, not by a huge margin, but just to take those tones away from that horrible garish color a little bit. Yeah, okay, I'm just looking at this from a, from a distance. Maybe try desaturating those greens. That's really subtle. That's just some green detail over here. In fact, I might not even bother with that, to be honest. Okay. Yeah, so I might come back to that later on. I'm not, <laughs> not entirely convinced about the, the color intensity now that I look at it, you know, as an overall picture. But I might come back to that and adjust that later. So now my, um, my other little technique that I like to use is uh, denoising and sharpening uh, based on masking areas of the image. So uh, this one, I think this photo was taken at ISO 800. So we got a little bit of noise, which is especially prominent across the background detail because it's mostly just flat tonal areas. Um, I'm going to denoise that and get rid of that. Mainly, not so much for aesthetic purposes, actually, mainly for... Um, compressibility or for compression efficiency. So obviously this noise is high frequency detail. Um, obviously I share a lot of my work on Instagram, Twitter, um, my website and so on. And so I need images to compress as efficiently as they are able to. So smoothing out noise from the background helps with that. So what I will do is use W twice to get to the selection brush tool. I'm going to be using a lot of keyboard shortcuts. Um, I will try and you know, let you know what I'm doing ahead of time, but sometimes I just like to kind of whiz around. So I'm going to make a rough selection of the insect here. Then I don't usually do this, but for this example, I'm going to jump into selection refinement. Okay, we've got some uh, detail here that I'm just going to drag across and mat. Okay, now if we were doing a cutout, this would be terrible. But thankfully we're not, we're just masking. Or rather, we're just masking an adjustment or a filter. So it doesn't really matter if the, the actual matted selection is a bit poor. We'd be hard pressed to really get a decent cutout from this anyway because of the shallow depth of field. Anyway, I will apply that. I've got my matted selection. So if I just use Q for quick mask, that's... Um, I use this all the time, by the way, Q for quick mask when I'm making selections, especially for high contrast images where it's hard to see the marching ants. So um, red overlay marks what's the background or what is excluded from the selection. And of course, anything that's included in the selection comes through. So now I've got my insect. I will add a live unsharp mask filter here. Um, Let's just set a radius of two and a factor of two, just to sharpen that up a little bit. There we go. Okay, and then uh, quickly, I'm going to invert the selection. For shortcuts to do this, I'm gonna use Shift Command I. So now if I quick mask that, you'll see that uh, the background is selected and not the subject. And then I can go ahead and add a live denoise filter. Okay, so then I will deselect and I'm just going to drag luminance up until that noise disappears. Okay, easy peasy. So, um, I will turn these off just for the time being, um, just for performance reasons, really. When you, when you use multiple live filters, performance can start to slow down a little bit. Not terribly, but, you know, given the choice, I just prefer to turn them off and then turn them on when I, I'm previewing the final image and ready for export. So, uh, let's have a look. Selective color. I love using the selective color adjustment. Um, <clears throat> da, da, da. Uh, Janelle, uh, when you say destructively, do you mean when you develop the raw file, the original is not saved? Um, so basically, if you're using like a DAM like Lightroom or Capture One, 
the you have you typically have like a sidecar file which contains metadata with all the adjustments in um so photo doesn't do that um along the lines somewhere we'll probably look at developing a dam like application but no word on that yet um so basically when you do, when you drag a raw file into affinity photo it is converted to rasterized pixel data um so if you wanted to actually go back to the original raw file and revise anything there you would have to redevelop it essentially like i say for my workflow this isn't really a problem because i start with a flat image anyway um and if i need to do anything really extreme to it like significantly change the white balance what i would do is develop a 32-bit linear unbounded which uh, is probably outside the realms of what we're getting into today um, but that gives you complete flexibility so no pixel values no color values are ever clipped uh, they might be out of range out of displayable range but they're never clipped but yeah we don't have like um, a sidecar non-destructive raw capability in photo yet so uh, just looking at this uh, side this selective color <laughs> nearly said sidecar there uh, good afternoon john glad you could join thank you very much for every anyone who's tuned in actually really appreciate this like i say i'm just kind of dipping my toe in the water because I, I thought it might be interesting for people to see the um the kind of the processes that i use generally when i'm image editing rather than you know some kind of pre-planned or pre-scripted demo or tutorial um so i'm using selective color at the moment i use this so much this adjustment i find it really really useful just for pushing colors around um especially for low light imagery if you've seen any of the sort of the low light imagery tutorials i've done i pretty much abuse selective color i use it so much um it's so great just for getting fine control over these color ranges so for example i could really bring out the reds in the the body here now um it's looking whoa okay yeah i didn't expect that so uh, this is why it's always a good idea to zoom out and check the whole image from time to time okay so these reds are just ridiculous at the moment that's fine um be for the paintbrush tool and i'll get the black here and just paint away from the background so now we're painting off these areas on the selective color mask you can see it on the thumbnail there in fact if i isolate that uh, that gives you a black and white representation of your mask or a grayscale sorry uh, so that gives you a, a better idea of what's being masked okay and to be honest to be honest at this point i don't think i'm going to really need a wider crop anyway i kind of want to focus on the insect so i'll get the crop tool and just crop in like so okay there's a nice sort of squarish aspect ratio to this okay let's see um maybe i might just try some structure enhancement so i can do that with a live clarity filter just drag that all the way up see what happens okay fine so i might invert that um again adjustments and filters in photo inherently have their own mask so you don't need to clip a mask to them already uh, uh anyway so if i invert that that inverts the clarity mask i can just use b for the brush tool paintbrush tool sorry I should watch my terminology uh switch across to white and just paint that in there so that clarity is now just masked to the insect might be a little bit strong so i'll take the opacity down maybe 75 percent something like that just to take the edge off the uh, the extremity of it and then i'll turn these two filter layers back on and i think i've got my final image let me just check what does that look like at a small zoom level yeah yeah that will do okay i'm happy with that okay i'm going to save this as an af photo file so it retains the layer structure and it means i can just go back later and you know make some changes if i want here's an interesting little uh, thing though so 16-bit document uh, raster data obviously is, is quite large file size related anyway you know for a 24 megapixel file um you're probably looking at i don't know 120 megabytes something like that um but also what photo does is it saves a compressed snapshot in the document file 
So uh, this isn't shown by default. You usually have to go to View Studio to get it. In Snapshots, we've got that background snapshot, and I actually just like to get rid of that. Uh, it just shaves a few megabytes off the, uh, the file size before you save. So then I will save this. Let's see. Um, I'm just going to save this in a folder for now. Because I quite like this edit. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know. The tones are a little maybe too saturated. But again, I think what I'll do is come back to it with a fresh pair of eyes later on and see how I really feel about it. Okay, I'm going to close that down now. Let's see then. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah, so uh, I did some training down in London. I was nearly going to say last year. It would have been the year before now. God, time's flown, isn't it? Um, so I took these photographs at night. Uh, let's try one of these then. Da, 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 da. Oh, uh, you're welcome for the lesson, that is. Um, Ronnie, technically speaking, isn't it best to keep the sharp and do noise layers at the topmost layer? You say? To be honest, I don't think there is a right or wrong answer. Um, I prefer to keep it just above the any kind of pixel data that you're editing. Because then, if you're doing, um, say, color adjustments above that, then the denoising is already done. It really depends. I mean, I suppose the reason I tend to do that is because of astrophotography. So again, uh, I don't really want to get into you know too much technical detail at this point. But for astrophotography, you have like your linear data layers, right? And then you tone stretch it. Astrophotography needs a lot of tone stretching. So you've got like a gamma adjustment uh, using levels, and then you've got curves, and then you've got all kinds of other adjustments on top of that. And I often find that denoising above all of that um, isn't as effective. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I think experimentation is just key, really. So it's just kind of force of habit that I keep my denoising as far down the layer stack as I can before I sort of push tones even further. But that said, you know, there's a case to be made for putting it further up the layer stack. Um, I would probably denoise before any sharpening, though. Uh, sharpening will just exacerbate high frequency artifacting and make it harder to denoise. Okay. Um, Oh, Michael, um, I will either publish this after or I will, I'm recording it locally as well at, in glorious 4K. Um, so I might just kind of chop, you know, top, chop there, top and tail it and, uh, or maybe do a highlights reel or something afterwards. So don't worry. Um, this will be available to view one way or the other. Um, timeline in affinity photo, Aegith. Uh, no, not to my knowledge. Um, off the record, I would love some kind of motion graphic animation capability, but uh, I don't think we'll be seeing that for a long time if if there's any possibility of it. I mean, motion graphics with Affinity's um, rendering engine and the way that we can manipulate layers and uh, quick shapes around would just be immense. But yeah, <laughs> sadly not to be, at least for now. Okay, uh, so let's have a look at this image. Uh, highlight detail. Let's see. I might just take this down a little bit. Not too much though, because um, at a certain point, I yeah, I'm going to go off on a little rant here. People who, <laughs> sorry, this is very um, blank statement. People who do this right, shadows all the way up, highlights all the way down. Oh no, because you. How do I explain this? I mean, tonally, this is not what you see with your eyes anyway. Perceptually, it's just wrong. Um, I'm of a mind that highlights should be bright. They should be perceptually bright. So if you go and flatten them all the way down, and there's very little contrast between highlights and the rest of the scene, just, mm, you know, and when you start with something this tonally flat, I've always found it's really hard to shape your tones back into it. So. I avoid extremes. Um, for example, with highlights, I'm actually going to bring them back slightly so that you do actually have some perceptual brightness there. And then the shadows, I'm going to take them right back as well. I might want to lift everything away from kind of like, you know, the murky sort of pure black, but not too much. Um, you know, and 
I also think there is a case, I, I know people are afraid of kind of, you know, losing detail, especially when you save your image out. Well, you know, clipping indicators here. Okay, so these highlights clipping, it's fine, but there's no data there anyway. So we were never going to get anything meaningful, meaningful from those. But there's no, you know, none of these dark tones are clipping. And when we carry it through to 16-bit precision, all that data is still there. Don't worry about it. You don't need to kind of push it up at the raw development stage just so that you avoid losing precision or losing data. Don't worry, it doesn't happen. All that data is there. It's just pixel values. You want to push it higher? Fine. Okay. Anyway, rant over. Let's uh, develop this and see what we can do with it. Okay. Um... Uh, found that pulling highlights in Affinity Photo terms on grey as opposed to Lightroom. I suppose that's a fair comment, really. I mean, um, there's. I, I think Lightroom does some kind of clever highlight reconstruction based on channel data. So you know, if say two channels are blown out but one isn't, it will interpolate uh, from the the channel that isn't blown out and and that type of thing. Um, that's just not something that Affinity Photo does yet as part of its raw development. I mean, hands up, you know, it's, if you want some really, um, kind of like next level raw development, you're probably looking in the wrong place for Affinity Photo. Affinity Photo's raw development is sufficient for most of the imagery I do and that type of thing. But I know that some people are sticklers for really having the ultimate raw quality. Um, but since 1.7, the demosaicing algorithm uh, was changed and overall, you know, in terms of noise and false color artifacting, that is a heck of a lot better. I mean, I, before 1.7, when I was doing astrophotography, um, like wide field stuff where you'd push the ISO high, I would not use photo. I, I'd pre-process it in something else. But since 1.7, I just quite happily drag my raw files into photo and I find the quality more than sufficient. Um, you know, and I'm quite, I'm a bit late, I'm a bit more laid back now, but you know, back then I was kind of like, I was a real stickler for quality. Um, so I was really happy that 1.7 brought about that change. Um, and yeah, since then I just kind of, I, I tend to just develop rules in photo now. So I'm, I'm more than happy with the quality. Uh, let's see. Oh, the Astro Guides, you're welcome. No, I love doing them. <laughs> I've probably got some more planned at a later date, but I, you know, I, I think the six videos for launch was probably a bit overkill, but I was just really passionate about it. Uh, okay, so um, let's see. I'm going to do my curves adjustment again. Uh, let's put some contrast back into this scene. Yeah, so this is a great case for using a luminosity blend mode rather than... Um, just a normal blend mode. So if I just undo that back to normal, you'll see that we also affect the color intensity. And we're really bringing out some nasty colors here. I mean, the horrible um, yellow from the, the street lighting just clashes horrifically with the, the sort of the blue. So if I redo that, you'll see that the color intensity dies down a little bit. And now we're just affecting the luminosity. So that's definite. I think this image is slightly wonky as well. I should looking at it from an angle. Yeah. So let's sort that out. C for the crop tool command and just draw that out like so. <laughs> that was like the smallest change. Maybe, it, maybe it's not, maybe I'm just going a bit crazy. Okay. Um, so I've got these, uh, alpha areas as a result of rotating. I actually have a macro. Um, now, let me see, where did I put it? Matic and King, I think is rasterize and in paint alpha. So that will rasterize the edges, uh, so that, oh, just do that again. That will rasterize the edges so that, um, when it in paints, it doesn't accidentally sample alpha and then it will fill the edges in quite nicely. So rather than having to crop and lose detail, it just fills out those corners. Okay. Let's get rid of that for now. Okay, uh, yeah, let's look at some color. So let's try the old faithful selective color. And hmm, okay, let's see if we can tackle yellows here. So I'm gonna take those yellows down a bit. Uh, maybe, hmm, I don't like, I don't like, I'm really struggling with this, these tones here. 
I don't think. I mean, I can take some of the garish yellow out. That's fine. Hmm. Real struggle with this, I think. I might have to think about another adjustment. Let me try the old divide blend mode. Uh, Tim, yeah, I think it might be parallax as well. To compound this, I think this was... Oh, no, it was shot with the 24 to 105. But it was probably shot at the white... Well, actually, you know what? <laughs> Rather than speculate, where's my info panel gone? Uh, sorry, the metadata panel even. Da -da -da -da. Let's see, focal length 41. Mm, yeah, okay. Yeah. I think I actually remember I had this um, tiny little Benro tripod and I think I tried to raise it as high as I could <laughs> off street level to try and, you know, avoid parallax. But yeah, there's probably a bit of that going on. It didn't look too bad, though. It was pro probably just caught me off guard. Uh, okay, so selective colour now. What am I doing? Fill layer, I think. Um, I use fill layers a lot, so I put them on Shift F as a shortcut. Let's turn that off for now. And we will, let's color pick off something in here, maybe, like there, just to sign that. Okay, so we turn the fill layer back on, we've got this color now. Set this to divide. Let's see, what's this done? Hmm. I'm <laughs> not a fan of that either, to be honest. Oh, I'm really struggling with this image. Uh, let's... Take the opacity down slightly, maybe. So we've got a, you know, if we take the opacity down, we get a slightly cooler blue, which mm, might work. I think I might have to use an HSL adjustment now. Get those yellows there and take the saturation out. Maybe push the luminosity up as well, so that also reduces colour intensity. Uh, yeah. Okay. That looks better, yeah. There's a bit of red, red in that flag as well that's annoying me so let's push those tones up to see before after mm. you know what <laughs> this is such a cheat um when in doubt i had a black and white adjustment because <laughs> uh you know, it's it's not, uh, yeah, okay. That looks better black and white, I think. I just, when when you just can't get on with mixed lighting, you know, low light urban photography, sometimes it pays just to have a look in black and white. Because that's quite striking, I think. Um, what I might do is create a new pixel layer. B for the paintbrush tool. Let's not have an off yellow let's have a white uh overlay blend mode take this down uh thanks emily let's uh paint in here okay so we're kind of i do this all the time with pretty much most genres of photography so um i'm on i'm at black at the moment here I'm just kind of darkening the areas that I don't want to draw the viewer's eye to and brightening the areas that I do want to draw the viewer's eye to. So it's kind of like non-destructive dodging and burning. But the great thing about doing it with pixel layers is you can experiment with the blend mode. You can use color, all sorts. It's, you know, there's loads of different um, ideas that you can explore with it. So here's the before and here's the after. So I quite like that, actually. Yeah. Now, um, just a little thing. So, um, I believe uh, there's an Affinity Revolution video on this as well about um, the black and white adjustment. So the black and white adjustment um, and its default values is not quite the same as, say, converting to grayscale. Uh, so when you convert to grayscale, effectively it calculates what's called the intensity. Okay, and this is actually um, weighted calculated values of red, green, and blue. So green is the color that we're most sensitive to, therefore green gets a higher weight, and then red's in the middle, and then blue is uh, kind of like the lowest weight. And it calculates intensity of pixel values based off that weight, okay? So black and white adjustment does not do this, which means 
the black and white result might not be exactly what you would expect, you know, from like a grayscale uh, conversion process. There's a really easy way to do that instead, and that's to use a live procedural texture. Okay, uh, just create a single equation line, target red, green, and blue, and then just do RGB to I, and then use R, G, and B as the three input values. Okay, and that will do a weighted intensity grayscale calculation. So it probably won't look that different. <laughs> um, but actually, in this case, I'm trying to decide whether I like that blown out look. I mean, in some ways, it's quite extreme. But I don't know, there's some, something about it that kind of stands out. I mean, maybe, just maybe, if we put a shadows and highlights filter just underneath that procedural texture and just took it down a smidge, not too much, just a little bit, maybe that might work. Hmm. I quite like that. And I don't really even think I have to do any further tonal work. That just kind of works as is. Um, I might just go for a square crop. Just drag that smack bang in the middle there. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, some interesting ideas there. Uh, delete that for now. So, uh, here's the before and here's the after. Yeah. Okay. And again, I'll delete the snapshot and save that into my folder to pick up later. I might post some of these on Instagram. Okay. Uh, Dave, do you have any, do you have a beginner set of videos of the newbie variety? Um, not new videos. Uh, I think in the forums, there's like a legacy tutorials thread. And I think Miguel Boto's, I hope I pronounced that surname right. Sorry, Miguel, if you're watching. Um, uh, I think Miguel's site still has the old tutorials listed. And I did like, um, they're pretty kind of rough now, but uh, like a beginner's set. And it talks about things like layers, uses motion graphics to explain what layers are, you know, how they interact with each other, how they go above and beneath. Um, but yeah, I would like to get round to the possibility of redoing like a beginner's set. So thank you for the nudge. Um, Aga, how about desaturating only yellow? <laughs> Sorry, that's too late now. I've just closed it down as a spot mask. Yeah, that could have worked as well, actually. Yeah. Um, but to be honest, I just wasn't feeling the colours in this at all. Um, they're just a bit nasty, really. There's a limited amount I could do with them. Uh, let's see. Hmm, slightly underexposed one. Let's give this a shot. Because I'm seeing potential for some interesting colours here. Okay, so yeah, this is an underexposed image. Uh, I'm going to take the highlights down slightly. Again, not all the way, because look at this. That It's just, it's sorry, this is a real bugbear of mine. I'm going to go on a rant again. This is totally flat. It's just, it, it's not what highlights are, you know? So we're going to bring them back a little bit so that they're slightly bright. Uh, push the shadow detail up a little bit just to bring it away from black, or alternatively, we could just raise the black point. Sorry, lower the black point, technically. Um, yeah, that will do as a starting point. Um, could you demo how to correctly use the developed persona? Huh. <laughs> um, I think you've probably come to the wrong place. I don't do a lot of developed persona work, I'm afraid. I mean, um, basically, for this type of imagery, I, to be honest, I wouldn't try and do too much in the developed persona because, again, I would go for the non-destructive layer stack approach. I would try and get as flat a possible, uh, as flat as possible a result using develop, whether that's using shadows and highlights and using black point, or even on the assistant up here, uh, taking the tone curve off. So you don't even have like a contrast tone curve. You get a really flat image to start with. I don't need that for this particular image, but that's something you can experiment with. And then you're free to kind of push tones around all you want without committing anything using adjustment layers. Um, 
trying to think if there's anything else I can really show, but I, I don't think there is, to be honest. Um, don't forget you've got white balance adjustment as well, but again, I'm not too fussed about that since I will be gradually manipulating the colors anyway. As long as it's in the ballpark, that's fine for me. I will click develop. Okay, right. I'm going to go rid of that snapshot now, just so I remember. Uh, let's start with the curves adjustment like we always do. Crunch those tones. Push them up. And again, I'm going to go for a luminosity blend mode. I use this. Oh, actually, you know what? No. No, 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 no. I think I will stick to normal so that I'm affecting the color intensity as well. Didn't like that look at all. Okay, so um, actually I'm going to go back into this and I'm going to take the highlights down a little bit so that we're not intensifying them so much. The reason is I'm going to do some brushwork down here, I reckon. So let's have a crack at this now. I'm going to create a new pixel layer. Oh, spell that correctly. Um, uh, sorry, I'm, I don't know how to pronounce your, your name, uh, but yes, some kind of live develop. If Maybe if like the background pixel layer uh, contained a link to the raw file and you could double click it to go back into develop and redevelop everything, that would be incredible. Um, but we've heard nothing about that internally yet, so, you know, but still, uh, I, I see exactly where you're coming from. That would be really useful. Okay. Um, Brushwork. Overlay blend mode. B for the paintbrush tool. X to toggle across to white. So now, if I hover, yep, down here, we're going to see the effect. Let's take the opacity down to about 50. And just brush into these areas. And uh, just also brush up that building slightly as well. Okay. It's looking good. Okay, now let's do some more color work. So I'll create another pixel layer. Call this color work. B for the brush tool. Um, and now I want to use an overlay blend mode. Hmm, let's try 50%, but that might be too strong. Then what I'm going to do is color pick. So option click, drag off various tones in the water here. Ooh, my apologies if anyone actually heard that. Hopefully you didn't, that was my stomach going. <laughs> uh, I had a light lunch, so my stomach's complaining slightly. Okay, uh, let's see, and I'm just kind of going through, this is quite subtle what I'm doing, but you know, I just love experimenting with this type of approach. So that water is really kind of starting to sing now. Um, so much so that I might go into my curves adjustment and take it down a bit more because um, I kind of wanted to do some more layer work. So let's call this reflect. Set the blend mode to reflect. Now, reflect is really sensitive. So if we have something like a, a red up here and we paint it in, that's way too strong. Um, but I am just going to keep it at a higher opacity for now, just so that I can see what I'm doing. And then I'll take it down once I'm finished. Okay. Da, 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 da. There we go. Okay. Take that down to maybe 12%. So really, it's just kind of adding a little bit of a, an extra glow, a, a sort of a sheen to areas of the water down here. And... If we just have a look, this is what all of our brushwork has done to this image. So that's quite dramatic. Um, let's see. Sharpening. Yes, I suppose we should really do some sharpening. Uh, again, I think what I'll do is get the selection brush tool, uh, use Q for quick mask, make a really rough selection of this. I think I might refine this. Um, but photo is kind of make, going to make a little bit of a butchery out of it because, uh, this is not, <laughs> I mean, to be honest, any kind of image editing app would do this 
it's um just not the right kind of image to be refining but it's okay because all i really want is a matted selection or a mask that's kind of roughly in the ballpark for my sharpening that will do for me so let's sharpen that with a live on sharp mask let's try that for now okay mm, yeah looking okay looking good Oh, I've got to denoise, of course. Um, yeah, so this is a really useful tip, actually. Um, I've already deselected. So to get my selection back, I can just Command or Control click to get that selection back, then invert it. So Shift, Command, I, and then I can add my denoise filter. <laughs> We're really splitting hairs here, but again, it's it's... For me, it's not always about the fact that you would see the noise, because in this image, you probably wouldn't, to be honest, you know, unless you, I mean, I had to zoom all that way in just to see the noise here, you see. But ultimately, by smoothing all that uh, detail out, I'm going to make the image easier to compress, you know, when I, it, it gets exported to JPEG or something like that. So, okay, I think I'll leave it there for this image. Actually, no, I won't. Who am I kidding? Right, let's uh, get a selective color in there. Let's see what we can do with these reds. So take cyan out a bit. Push magenta up, push yellow up. Do the same to yellows. Oh, look at that. Oh, it's just, I can't get enough of this adjustment for low light imagery. It's just so powerful. <laughs> Not that you'd want to, but you can completely change the color of that. Um, that's quite nice, actually. Yeah, okay. So that wasn't initially what I was going for, but that's interesting. Okay. Uh, I think I will leave it there, you know. It's easy to kind of get carried away and think, oh, yeah, I can do this, I can do it, I can do all this to it. And then you end up coming away with something that's massively overcooked so let me save that and let's see what else i've got in the bag um you're welcome why <laughs> um no no news about the dam yet um and yeah i know finder is kind of like i'll tell you what actually while i'm here i can't remember when they brought it in was it catalina um they got rid of the um i forget what it's called now the flip book preview where you can use your mouse wheel and it's kind of like the, you can flip through and it's like a bit of a picture book style. I was gutted when they took that out. I, I don't know why, maybe it just didn't seem very professional, but honestly, it was the, the easiest way of going through an entire folder full of raw files and JPEGs and whatever else, and just quickly going, you know, scrolling through and going, yeah, I'll have that one, drop that in. And they took it away, and now you've got this instead, and you've got to use the arrow keys, and it's so much clunkier and slower. I don't know if anyone else finds that um i ended up using fast raw viewer i don't have my hard drive connected at the moment so i can't give you a quick demo of it or anything but i use fast raw viewer to cull and organize and uh, i used it to kind of uh, make a short list of all these images here i just I, I have um hotkeys or shortcuts set up so that i can easily make a selection of files and copy them to a folder this folder in particular so I would recommend having a look at Fast Raw Viewer. Uh, it's by the authors of uh, LibRaw, which is the raw library engine that we use as well. Fun little fact for you there. Let's have a look at this Robin. So this is a kind of a twee feel-good photo. It's not really very professional, but, you know, this little Robin uh, was feeding off this uh, lady's hand, and I just thought, you, you can't ignore that, you know. So, um... Uh, da -da 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 -da. What about get some perspective correction? Oh, do you mean on the image that I've just done? Uh, sorry, too late for that. Or do you mean just generally? Because um, we've got live perspective correction in photo, which is quite useful. Um, I don't know if I've got any examples to show that. Yes. Fan of fast review. Yeah, it's brilliant. Yeah. Uh, the only thing I have found, actually, is um, I have to turn off uh, the GPU acceleration or at least set the memory usage to low because it actually interferes too much with photo. Um, photo, you, with Metal Compute, um, it really maxes out the GPU, so anything else that conflicts with that 
are you going to have a bit of a bad time, really? Okay, um, let's see. What am I going to do to this raw file? Probably not a great deal. Um, I will just point out, actually, that uh, it doesn't. it's probably not really, really relevant for this image because I don't really think we've got many colors in this image that would be outside the range of sRGB. But if I'm doing sort of low-light imagery, like the London example I just showed you, um, and I'm not doing this for live streaming, so you know I, I can work in a wide gamut. I will use ROM RGB. Okay. Um, word to the wise as well. If you're going to use some, a wide gamut profile like ROM RGB or uh, Profoto, essentially the same thing. Um, even P3 to some extent. Although Apple don't seem to have followed this uh, <laughs> this tact. Um, if you uh, what am I trying to say? Basically, 8-bit precision is possibly not enough resolution for a wider gamut profile. It's fine for sRGB, but if you start pushing tones around in Profoto or something like that in 8-bit, you might get some posterization. That's not a problem in Affinity Photo because it develops to 16-bit by default anyway, but just thought that's worth pointing out. So try not to use something like ROM RGB with an 8-bit document. Always try and use 16-bit. But because this is going to YouTube, Rec 709, there's really no point. So I'm going to stick with sRGB for now. Okay. Uh, let's see. White balance. Mm. I might try the white balance picker. I haven't really got anything to white balance off, to be honest. But let's see if that does anything. That actually makes it warmer. Which, no. Let's just leave it as it is. Okay. Let's carry this forward. And develop that. Okay. Yeah, custom built PC, tons of RAM. Yeah, my 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 PC has uh, sixty four gigs of RAM. It's just like, why not? You know, I, I was getting a custom build, and uh, I suppose I can justify that with maybe photogrammetry or really large panoramas. Maybe it's excessive. Really, I could have just used thirty two, but never mind. Okay, uh, so let's see. I'm just thinking about what I could do with this. Sorry, I keep knocking the mic. Um, if anyone is kind of wondering what, what, what's going on here, this is an absolutely huge pop shield. Um, uh, this is a Shure MV7. Anyone who's into this kind of thing, uh, live streaming or podcasting or anything, probably be familiar with that mic. Um, the pop shield that they send you with it is terrible. So people are buying the pop shield for the Shure SM7B, I think it is, instead, and using that one. But I've even found that I, I kind of, I like to eat the mic. I like to get really close. So I got one for, I can't remember which Shure mic it is, but it's absolutely ginormous. And it looks comical on this microphone. Um, but it's the only pop shield that actually stops plosives for me anyway. Uh, this one. Uh, although a lot of people have found it successful, just does not work for me because I like to have the mic really close. I love that, uh, uh, you know, that kind of presence. Anyway, microphones aside, let's get on with the editing. So what am I doing for this? Um, let's see. I'll start off with a curves adjustment. Okay, I'll go for my luminosity blend mode as usual. Let's push those highlights up a little bit, but not too much. Okay. Um, you know what? This is really dodgy and I don't usually advocate this, but I am going to try and enhance the depth of field on this image. I have no, no idea if this will work, but let's give it a try. So I am blocking out a rough selection of my uh, proposed foreground here. Got the Robin's teeny tiny little legs. Let's just grab them like so and do the same for the other leg. Okay. And then I will jump into selection refinement. Oh, just mark that there. Map that. Okay. Got a bit of fur there, let's map that. 
That was a terrible idea. I don't know why I did that. Should have just matted that instead. Okay, this is probably about as good as we're going to get. Oh, we've got some frayed edges on the uh, the cardigan there. Okay, so that's my foreground. I'm going to save that as a spare channel, just in case I need to come back to that later. So, foreground. Let's invert that. Save it as the background. Are you ready for this? This might not work at all. This might be absolutely horrendous. So uh, let's roll the dice, shall we? I'll add a live lens blur. Blur that out like so. And then load the background mask or channel to the alpha. Oh, wow, that looks terrible already. Okay, let's take the radius down slightly. So it's just starting to... Ooh, I don't know. I don't know. Does it work? Not really. Oh, it's so subtle. <laughs> Never mind. It was worth a try. We probably need a, a Z depth mask or something, or, you know, from a portrait mode on a phone to do that successfully. <laughs> okay. What else? Um, I'm going to hide that for now because the effect is just barely pronounced. Selective color again. I really like this selective color, don't I? Uh, let's see. Let's get some nice, rich red tones on that robin's breast there. Okay, um, so what I will now do is invert the selective color mask. Paintbrush tool, paint back in over that area, like so. There we go. So that's a nice red breast. In fact, I'll tell you what, it was a good idea that we made those masks, or rather those uh, channels. I will, let's see, take the saturation out, but just mask it to the background. Okay. Ooh, we're veering dangerously towards color pop territory which uh, I have a few words to say about. So let's not go overkill, reducing the background intensity. Because, <laughs> uh, yeah, um, I don't know. I just, I know, I know color pops are kind of eye catching, but they're a bit overdone by now, aren't they? Let's see. Um, da, 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 da. Let's see, any other questions I can answer? In the developer system, if I choose to use 16-bit precision, what's the difference between uh, apply tone curve or not? So basically, um, I'm just going to digress temporarily and find a nice nighttime raw image. So, take no action. Okay, so basically, um, again, I'll try not to get too bogged down in this. But it goes through, so the raw file, initially it's grayscale Bayer sensor data, right? Gets demosaic. Um, it's in linear color space at this point. And of course, to be more palatable and, you know, f for our perceptual purposes, it goes through gamma conversion or gamma encoding, right? And that's what this is. So this is the gamma encoded result. And then we apply a tone curve on top of that for a more contrasty result, which is more palatable as like a starting point. But of course, you can choose to take that off uh, if you want to use your own tone curve, or if you just want a really flat, almost log-like image that you want to shape the tones with. Um, now, here's the thing. When you set raw output to 32-bit, it takes the tone curve off automatically for you. Now, I know some people go and apply it again, which yeah, kind of def not entirely defeats the point of 32 bit, but mostly. So when you apply this tone curve, that's a bounded tone curve, right? So when you're when you're talking 32 bit values, you're talking floating point. That's zero to one, and then anything above one is considered HDR, and it's not displayable unless you have an HDR display, right? That's that's um, HDR merging. You know, you have all those tones above one that need mapping to within that range of zero to one. If you go and apply a tone curve <laughs> to that 32-bit precision output, it clamps the values. So you kind of negate 
one of the main benefits of being in 32-bit anyway. Um, that's why it deliberately takes the tone curve off for you, so that there are no values being clamped. Anyway, I'm getting lightheaded just talking about that, so I might have to uh, whew, come back to that. Okay, uh, so where were we? Um, oh, uh, Affinity Photo works internally in 32-bit. At tone curves overdone we're right. Yeah, so sorry, um might just have explained that. So when photo develops a raw file, and you, when you're in a developer persona and you're moving all your sliders around, everything else, that is all being done internally in 32-bit floating point unbounded precision. So even if you've got blown out highlights, you can drag the highlight slider back, recover them, etc. That's fine. When you develop your raw image and you move back to the photo persona, that's when it by default gets converted to 16-bit and then it gets, um, that becomes the gamma encoded version and also the values outside of the range of 0 to 1 are clipped, okay? Of course you can negate that by taking your document through with 32-bit using that assistant option, but by default, yes, that's what happens. Um, uh, yes, so applying a tone curve on a 32-bit document will ruin the linear scene referred data in the sense that, yes, it will clamp the values um, so anything outside that 0 to 1 range gets clamped and then is unrecoverable, which obviously you don't want. Um, oh, <laughs> duplicate the layer and then paint the legs and details so the large blur setting works. You know what? I will indulge you <laughs> on that suggestion. Let's give this a try. So what do we, hang on, what do we need to do? We need to cut the robin out first, don't we? So again, I'm not entirely convinced this is going to work, but let's give it a shot. Let's see if we can actually make it work. Actually, you know what? I could just load the foreground, couldn't I? There we go, load the pixel selection. Okay. Um, Make that little section there. Oh, and we got a bit of the robin's breast there. So I will refine that. Let's see. I honestly don't think this is going to work particularly well. Create a new layer. Okay, undo that. Uh, duplicate the background layer. Get the in-painting brush. I cannot wait to see what it comes up with as the in-painting result for this. This is going to be interesting. <laughs> okay. Hopefully it will just be the sensible thing, which is some kind of tiled repetition of the background detail. Oh, great. You found it, Dave. Awesome. Good stuff. Okay, let's turn that layer back on and then we will add, if, let's get rid of that lens blur now. We will add a lens blur underneath the cutout layer. Oh, <laughs> oh, I don't know. Ooh. Do I like that? <laughs> Maybe at an Instagram resolution. Maybe. Well, you know what? We'll go with that for now. <laughs> okay. Not, not really what I would choose to do, but fair play. Yeah. All right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, let's see, unsharp mask. Um, you know what, I'm getting a bit lazy now, so I am going to add my sharpening effect. Then I'm going to invert that and just paint it into my robin, like so, and maybe a bit of the hand, but nothing else. Then I'm gonna ooh, reset that crop crop this in 
like so. So I kind of mm, I wanna, don't want to crop it too tight. I still want a bit of context there, you know. Uh, let's see. Do I dare to make a selection of, or rather, get a curves and mask it to the background? Just to take the background down slightly. Okay, that's not actually as bad as I thought it would be. Yeah, just takes the edge off the background, helps a bit more with the uh, subject separation. Um, that red breast needs to pop a bit more, doesn't it? So let's use HSL for that. Bring that out. Invert that. Paintbrush tool. Paint back in. Like so. Cool. Okay. That'll do for now. Yeah. Um, I might come back to that. Maybe, in fact, maybe just crop the bottom a little bit. Like so. There we go. Okay, yeah. I'm going to save that now. Oh, that is a lot of effort for uh, what is essentially just like a whimsical feel-good picture, isn't it? Okay. Um, I might call it a day soon, so... I'll tell you what. Um, let's just do this quickly. Because... Um, I am I taking that tone curve off? Yes, I have. Ah, okay. Let's not have that catch me out. So I'm going to reopen that boom in 16 bit. Okay. Um, again, raw raw development wise, not a lot to do here. <laughs> um, I will just reiterate something I said earlier because I, I think this really needs to be stressed. Because I actually, before I really studied um, signal data bit depth, precision, all of that. I was of the mind that you had to kind of make the most of the histogram here. Like you had to have the most sensible distribution of tones. Okay. Really don't. So, you know, uh, for example, let's say all your hist you know, all your data here is bunched in the middle, right? You might think, oh no, to make the most of this precision and you know, everything, I've got to make sure that I have pixels near black and then um, excuse me, pixels near pure white. You don't need it. Maybe if you were working purely in 8-bit, you might be able to make a case for that. Um, I mean, that's why we do, that's why we do gamma encoded images to make the most of that limited resolution, you know, like 8-bit precision. But we're working internally in 32-bit. It's getting converted to 16-bit, which gives you 65,536 possible color values per channel. Uh, yeah, you don't need it. Don't worry. So this is fine. Okay. Um, I'm going to click develop. That was an easy raw develop process, wasn't it? <laughs> Literally do nothing. Uh, okay. Let's add a curves adjustment. Now I'm a bit of a, I'm a bit of a weird one. I love doing, I guess you could call them cloud studies. Luminosity blend mode again for that. I just love taking, especially like telephoto pictures of clouds and really looking at the sort of the, the structure and the detail in. Um, and I think that's, that's what fascinates me with astrophotography. That's why I'm so keen on that because I love doing image processing to kind of bring out structure and detail in, you know, scientifically and mathematically the process behind astrophotography, you know, and, and the, the, you know, the, the reasoning behind why we stack the data to average it and produce a better signal to noise ratio, blah, 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 blah. It's all fascinating to me. And I think it comes from, you know, this kind of, this interest in looking at structure and detail. So for this, for example, you know, uh, what I might do is get rid of that background snapshot, uh, add a live clarity filter. Oof, look at that. Okay. So that's obviously overkill. Um, but I'm going to invert that. B for the paintbrush tool. Just paint back in over the areas where I want that to apply. Like so. Okay. Then I can take the strength down. So I can just kind of bring it up a little bit. 
Mm, like that. Something like that. Although, is that too strong? If you have to ask the question, you probably already know the answer. So yes, let's back that off a little bit. Da, da, da. Dave, <laughs> can I dance fast enough? I hope so. I'm not a very good dancer. Um, so, uh, oh, 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 okay, right. So that was that was definitely positive. If you're you're telling people to hit that like button, okay. I'm glad we cleared that up. Um, yeah, the lens, um, the depth pass. So interesting thing. Um, when photo first came out in beta, so that was version one point four there was actually a Z blur filter and you could load a grayscale depth mask that disappeared, I think before public release and has not been seen since. It's just mysteriously vanished, possibly because it didn't work very well. I don't know. Um, but yeah, we did actually have that. So I might, it might be interesting to chase that up and see whether that can be reinstated at some point. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, no, no worries. Um, I appreciate everyone tuning in to watch and, and chatting with me. Yeah, I've, I've wanted to do this for the longest time. I did it for the, um, the lockdown session last year, but I, I just always thought that I, you know, I don't know. I am always tired, to be honest, by four o'clock after a full day of work. And uh, also I kind of felt that I, ha I needed content to kind of justify it. But then I thought, you know what? Just, just dip your toe in the water. Just do a session where you literally just sit down and edit some images and give people an idea of the process. And, you know, if somebody chucks me some hardball affinity photo questions while I'm at it, fair enough, you know. Uh, let's see. So, HSL adjustments. Let's now let's see there's some red color hiding in here that's fascinating to me. It doesn't. I mean, I, <laughs> I don't, whoa, yeah, let's not do that. So I might just kind of maybe just bring out a hint of that. That is fascinating to me. There's red in there. And have we got some yellow as well? Yep, we've got yellow. Okay. Yep, and then maybe just to separate the cloud and the background, I'll go for blue and take the luminosity shift down. Not too much, because then we start to get, it's not quite posterization, but it, it, it just, I think it, you know, our eyes can tell this, this does not look right. It's not natural. So maybe about there, just re reduce that a tad. Yeah, something like that. Okay. I think a crop might help tighten this composition up as well. Something, but I don't want to crop that off over there. I really like that tail to the cloud. Let's try that. Hmm. Almost looks like a hammer or an axe or something in the sky. Okay, uh, let's see what we're doing on the wave scope. Oh yeah, um, by the way, I, um, thanks Dave, <laughs> very enthusiastic. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't use the histogram an awful lot. The reasoning behind this is because I don't find it particularly useful. Um, I mean, yeah, it tells you uh, maybe a particular color channel is clipping. It doesn't tell you where, though. So I prefer to use the scope panel, which isn't shown by default. You can get it off view in studio here um, because you get things like intensity waveforms. So now, you know, I get a rough representation of the tones um, across kind of like the spatial frequency of my image. So, you know, I can see uh, these tones here are quite bright in the middle. Um, and also if I'm doing portrait retouching, I use the vector scope for the eye line as well, which is quite useful getting skin tones, right? And then you've got things like RGB parade as well. Um, so that's a little bit more useful because it, it tells you, it gives you like a spatial representation of where tones are bright and dark as opposed to the histogram. It's just a bit, just not my thing really. Um, I'm waffling on, let's round off this image. I'm starting to not like the colour now. Uh, I might go in and take that back a little bit. I think I kind of like the almost sort of quasi desaturated look. So I might use a black and white adjustment. Take the opacity down slightly. 
20%. Yeah, I think I like that. Yeah. Okay. That one is getting saved. Let's put that in the bank. Why did that not work? <laughs> okay. Just click save rather than hit return on the keyboard. Yeah, fine. Okay. Oh, wow. Look at the time. Okay. I'm going to do one more for you. Um, it's going to be an HDR merge. So uh, I occasionally, you know, especially over the summer last year, you know, I'd get woken up by the, the light just streaming in through my window. So I've got uh, my bedroom is north facing. So um, I basically just get blasted by the sun, you know, when the sun rises now at sort of six in the morning. And occasionally it does inspire me to get up, to go up and uh, go and capture a sunset, uh, sunrise, sorry. So that's what I've got here. I'll uh, get my raw files, chuck them in. Now, um, I turn off noise reduction and tone map HDR image. I don't like default tone mapping being done for me. I also don't like noise reduction being done for me because by principle, what it's doing anyway is it's equalizing the exposures, uh, you know, all five of them in this case, and then it's merging together the most detailed uh, pixels from each image. By the way, that was ridiculously fast. Um, I, I can't believe this comes across as a bit of a sales pitch, but I am using a, a Mac Mini M1. Granted, it's a 16 gigabyte model. I got it about three weeks ago, and I am absolutely chuffed to bits with it. I was really skeptical. The reason I got it was because I, I always wanted a home Mac. I wanted something that was reasonably powerful, but, you know, not fully spec'd out or whatever. So I thought, well, these new M1 Mac Minis look quite good, you know. Um, and didn't have a portability requirement, so I didn't go for a MacBook or anything, and because they're expen they're more expensive anyway. But oh wow, this is it's blown me away. I mean, it's replaced my work machine, which is a fully spec'd out MacBook Pro, you know, i9 processor, 64 gigs of RAM, 5500m AMD GPU. Um, yeah, it's just ridiculous. I mean, the Affinity apps, granted, uh, you know, they are optimized for it. Other software might not be still at this point. But even with, you know, going through the translation layer, it, this thing is fast. It's really snappy. So, um, yeah, if anyone's after like a cheap desktop machine, don't overlook the Mac Mini because the, the M1 chip is really impressive. I can't wait to see what Apple come out with. It's the first time I'd actually recommend buying an Apple product, to be honest. Um, you know, I mean, we get them through work, which is fine. But for my own personal hobbyist use, I, I would always go for a Windows PC because comparatively everything's cheaper. But yeah. Whew. Mac Mini all the way. Anyway, moving on. Um, I'm going to bring up my macro library panel because, in fact, you know what? I'll hide that and show you why I'm doing this. So at this point, right, we would go for tone mapping. So that's the tone mapping persona up there. Um, just give that a couple of seconds to do its magic. And that basically finds, you know, ways of mapping values out of the range of zero to one to within the range of zero to one, right? So we, we have these values, these high dynamic range values that can't be displayed and we map them within range. Okay. But I don't find, I mean, it's serviceable. Don't get me wrong. Um, and you know, if you want that horrific, uh, overcooked local contrast look, you can do that as well using local contrast. That's fine. Um, but I, I don't prefer to do any of that. So I come out there instead and I actually use, um, I did these for, um, editing blender renders, open EXR blender renders, uh, because, um, if anyone uses blender for 3d work, um, Troy Sabotka did these filmic view transforms, right? Um, so gamma corrected view transforms that, uh, basically map the dynamic range from linear to gamma encoded in a really nice way. Um, gives you a lovely kind of um, photorealistic look. And uh, you can use these in Affinity Photo by setting up the open color IO configuration from Blender. But that is a bit of a faff. So what I did instead was I kind of deconstructed the um, sort of profiled what was going on on the GPU. Um, got the values, the transform values that were being used, and stuck them in a procedural texture live filter, um, used the LUTs around that as well, and built it all into some macros here. So although these are actually intended for 3D renders, they actually work really well for tone mapping HDR photography as well. 
It's the same principle. You're taking these linear unbounded values and mapping them to a gamma encoded range. So what we end up with is a very flat logarithmic look, but then everything's in range. And uh, you'll notice actually on the histogram here, even those really bright areas, look, they're squeezed in here, but not in a way that looks horrible and unnatural. So now I can bring this down, push these tones up slightly like that. And still, you know, I, I really like this kind of naturalistic result that I'm getting here. Um, let me think. Let's do an HSL adjustment. Pump the reds up slightly and the yellows. Ooh, maybe not too much. I'm trying to keep this natural, you know. I'm trying not to overcook it. Okay. Um, let me see what else can I do for this. Here's an interesting thing as well. If I do something like a clarity filter. Okay, enhance that. Invert that mask, just paint it back into a bit of the foreground detail here. If you put clarity just above the pixel layer, so it's affecting the linear encoded data, it will look slightly different to above the filmic group, which is uh, performing the gamma encoded uh, look. So you'll see here, if it goes directly above the linear encoded value, oh, <laughs> directly above the linear encoded values, it's more aggressive, or rather, is it more aggressive actually? No, it's less aggressive. That's interesting. I would have expected it to be the other way around, but okay, I'm not going to argue. So it's actually less aggressive, which is interesting to me but I will take it. Okay. So I'm not sure if I like that. So I'll turn it off for now. Um, new pixel layer. Let's create a blend mode, pixel layer, something like 25% and just paint into the foreground ever so slightly just to raise those tones. Not a little bit, but yeah. Oh, well, uh, thank you, Aegith. Uh, sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. Um, yeah, um, Apple Silicon, better GPU capability. Yeah, um, I mean, to be honest, the, the GPU and the M1, um, the I'm using the photo beta now, the 192, one, yes, 192, 229. Um, the lead photo developer uh, made a few optimizations there. Um, in terms of queuing buffer commands. So actually the, the GPU score goes up by about a thousand raster points, I think roughly. And the score now sort of sits at around the 8,000 mark, which is actually what I'm getting for my 5,500 M MacBook um, GPU. And it's on par with, I think like a, a GTX 1080, um, something like that, maybe, um, maybe like a, 2060 something like that so to be honest that's not it's not it's not terrible um and i'm really i am i'm i'm right with you there i'm excited to see what the next level is going to be because inevitably they're going to put this silicon in the you know like imac replacements um macbook pro uh like 16 inch or whatever replacements i'm really excited to see what kind of gpu capabilities they come up with there because I, I could imagine, you know, if, if it's this good for like a, a first public iteration, it's, it's going to be pretty mind blowing what they come up with next. That's the hope anyway. So uh, a new pixel layer, overlay blend mode. Let's try 50% maybe. Color pick off a nice warm tone here. Maybe make that a bit brighter actually. And I'm just going to stamp into this area here. So I've just got a bit of glow coming out of this area. That's <laughs> when you see, I always recommend, you know, it's easy to get carried away when you're working in detail in a zoomed in portion of your image, but sometimes you just need to take a step back and zoom out because that is, that's just, it's too strong. 
So 20% maybe. Can we get away with that? That's nice. Yeah, that's a nice little bit of glow. That will do. Okay. Um, to be honest, there's not a lot more to do with this. I'm... I'm deliberately trying not to over edit it or overcook it. I just I want I want to portray that that kind of warmth, that sort of the mist rising off the floor there. Just just this kind of lovely glow, you know, sunrise glow. So I'm not going to go too extreme with this image. I'm gonna leave it there before I do anything else to it that I might regret. But of course. You won't regret it for long because it's all non-destructive anyway. So, you know. Ooh, yeah. Okay. No, I don't like that clarity now. Uh, fifty percent opacity, maybe. Twenty-five. Mm, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll take that. All right. Let's save this then. Okay. So those were uh, a few images that I've just spent some time editing and uh, look at just looking at the clock now. I'm going to draw a line under this because I could get carried away and just go on for absolutely ages. <laughs> um, and also, I don't want to burn through any more material I might have for future live sessions. So, um, I will just see if there's anything else I can address. No. Mind-blowing creative usage of that OCIO. Yeah, it's... um, Yeah, I, I, I started using OpenColor.io transforms uh, specifically the the blender ones uh, like a couple of years ago for hdr photography and um yeah i just thought wouldn't it be nice to package this up in a way that had no dependency on open color io that you could just literally run a macro and and and, and it's there so um i spent a while just kind of decoding all of this and if i just show you actually um we don't have a normalized log transform function in procedural texture at least not yet so this is the approximation which is a bit crazy um yeah that's the sort of the minimum unbounded value as well but yeah that's my equation for the uh, that's the normalized log transform um and then on top of that we've got some other transforms going on uh kind of like from picking apart the uh, the open color io um, transforms and implementation but anyway i'm waffling on no one want, no one wants to know about all that techie nonsense anyway so thank you very much everyone for tuning in it's been a pleasure really um i'm glad that you know i actually got some viewers worst case scenario i would just be talking to myself and it would be a bit be a bit demoralizing so i really do appreciate everyone jumping on and you know having a bit of a, a conversation with you all um it's been lovely Thank you very much for engaging. And I think it's given me a bit of confidence to go on and do another one at some point. So do keep your eye on Twitter. I'll post there ahead of time. Um, maybe not Instagram, but I'll, I'll, I'll try and post on Reddit as well. I'm not sure if there are any viewers from Reddit, but uh, I'll post on the Affinity Photo subreddit there. But yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to show you the lovely intermission motion graphic thing that I put together as an ending, uh, just so that I can also spend a bit of time just chatting with you as well. But anyway, thank you very much for watching. Take care, everyone.